Alexa, get me a new outfit. Yes, Siraj. Nice. Hello world, it's Siraj, and let me show you how to build, train, and serve an app on AWS that predicts if customers are unhappy using a given mobile carrier. That way we can prevent them from leaving by giving them incentives to stay. You've probably heard about AWS. It's Amazon's gigantic collection of cloud computing services that offer developers and businesses databases, storage, management tools, analytics, networking, deployment options, Jeff Bezos, basically everything you need to create and scale an app to millions of users. Amazon currently commands a third of the cloud computing market. That's three times more than its next biggest competitor, Microsoft. But why use the cloud in the first place? Well, if you're doing some machine learning locally and try to load a data set into memory, chances are you've seen an error like this before. That's because RAM was exhausted on your machine and the operating system couldn't allocate another, say, 500 megabytes of RAM. One possible solution could be to upgrade your RAM, but another is to use a virtual machine in the cloud with more RAM and CPU. Because hundreds of thousands of customers are aggregated in the cloud, AWS can achieve higher economies of scale, which translates to lower pay-as-you-go prices for the developer. And you don't have to think too much about computing power. Usually, you either have too much or too little, but the cloud can give you just as much as you need whenever you need it. If we try and sign up for AWS on the website, it'll briefly ask us for credential details and we can have an account set up pretty fast. And they'll ask us for a credit or debit card. They won't charge unless we authorize it. After this, we can see the AWS dashboard with a listing of every service it provides. And this can be overwhelming at first to any developer who first sees it. Since we're doing machine learning, we know that we need compute. So let's go over some of these compute options, starting with EC2. Back when Soldier Boy was cranking that, if we wanted to create an app that could be accessible to people on the internet, we'd need to buy or rent a server. But if our server got less traffic than we expected, we'd have a huge loss in revenue. With EC2, we don't have to worry about that. EC stands for Elastic Computing, and it's a concept that represents the ability to automatically scale up and down the amount of compute necessary for an application. EC2 is a collection of globally distributed Linux servers, likely running a customized version of Red Hat Enterprise Linux that allows customers to create virtual machines that use any one of a variety of operating systems from Windows to FreeBSD. A virtual machine is a program that acts as a virtual computer. It runs on top of an operating system and has its own operating system. We can start with an EC2 instance that fits our needs and configure it to scale up according to the traffic with whatever dependencies we need installed on it. But while EC2 gives us a computing instance with an operating system, sometimes we don't need all of the tools that come with that operating system for our application. That's where the EC2 container service becomes useful. Containers let us only use the necessary libraries libraries and tools to make our service work, so it's more lightweight and efficient. And if we don't want to configure any of the details of our EC2 instance, we can use LightSail. It's a pre-configured EC2 instance that makes deployment even faster. It's a trade-off between ease of use and configurability, and right in the middle of those two is Elastic Beanstalk, which handles a lot of the deployment details for you, but also gives you more configurability than, say, LightSail. Lambda lets you run code in response to events, like changes to your dataset, or say, image resizing that's necessary before a customer can classify an image they upload to your service. 
It executes your code only when it's needed and scales automatically from a few requests per day to thousands per second. And those are just the compute services. There's a lot more. I've linked to this really great article that explains each in detail for you in the video description. Now, remember, we're trying to do machine learning, not make some personal website. And luckily for us, Amazon recently released a service called SageMaker that makes the whole process much easier. SageMaker lets machine learning engineers build, train, and deploy machine learning models easily. The build module provides us with a hosted environment to work with our dataset, experiment with any algorithms, and visualize our output. It provides fully managed EC2 instances running Jupyter Notebooks that let us explore training data, pre-process it, all of this in the cloud immediately. These notebooks come preloaded with CUDA, TensorFlow, PyTorch, basically all the tools you need to start training models in the cloud. It also provides its own algorithms in the form of an SDK, both supervised like XGBoost and logistic regression and unsupervised like principal component analysis and k-means clustering. So let's get started with our app. Our dataset is publicly available on Kaggle and contains about 3,000 data points. Each data point has 21 attributes and describes the profile of a customer of an unknown US mobile operator, including their plan type and the amount of calls they make. So we'll first need to create an S3 bucket to store the dataset we'll be using in. S3 stands for Simple Storage Solutions. It manages data using an object storage architecture. Objects are called buckets and are the basic storage unit of S3. We'll name it something that we'll later remember. Now to our notebook. With the click of a button, we can create our own notebook instance that runs on AWS using SageMaker. We'll select the default instance type, create a new role for ourselves, and spin up our notebook. Once we open up our notebook, we can test out the installation of several popular machine learning frameworks by importing them, then running that code. Let's start by specifying the S3 bucket we just created as it's what we'll want to use for training data, as well as the role we created for ourselves. Next, we'll import the Python libraries we'll need to predict churn, including, of course, SageMaker. In our dataset, the last attribute is the one that matters most to us, whether or not the customer left the service or churned. It's a binary attribute and we'll use it as our label. It's what we want to learn the mapping of from the rest of the attributes, the input data, to this, our label. This is now considered a binary classification problem. Let's explore this data set a bit using pandas. We can see how frequently each feature appears and using matplotlib, we can visualize a histogram of the numeric features. Looks like only 14% of customers have churned and most of the numeric features are nicely distributed. It looks like they are evenly distributed geographically and more likely than not to have an international plan. Also, it seems like some of our features have 100% correlation with one another, which means that we don't need them all. We can just remove some of them to avoid data redundancy. Now for our algorithm. Let's use one called XGBoost, which is a bunch of decision trees. It actually goes by lots of different names like gradient boosted trees, multiple additive regression trees, stochastic gradient boosting. Boosting is an ensemble technique where new models are added to correct the errors made by existing models. Models are added sequentially until no further improvements are possible. Gradient boosting is a method where new models are created that predict the errors of previous models and then added together to make the final prediction. It's using gradient descent to minimize the loss when adding new models. This method supports both regression and classification problems. Since it seems like there are some variables in our dataset where both high and low values can predict churn, if we were to use linear regression, we'd need to generate some polynomial terms. 
it'd be better to use gradient boosted trees since they naturally account for nonlinear relationships between features and target variables, while also accommodating complex interactions between features. We can start by regularizing our data so that our categorical features are converted into numeric features. Then we can split the data into training, validation, and test sets, as this helps us prevent overfitting. This is when our model can't generalize well enough to new data points. When we start training, we need to specify the location of the XGBoost algorithm containers, and because we're training in the CSV format, we'll create S3 inputs that our training function can use as a pointer to files in S3. We can now decide on the values of our hyperparameters. How deep do we want each tree within the algorithm to go? How many boosting rounds? We can start by guessing these numbers and later on improve them. After training, we can deploy our model to a hosted endpoint, and once we have that endpoint, we can run inference really easily, as simple as making an HTTP POST request. When we run our model on our test data, we can see that it's mostly correct at predicting the customers who've turned. I hope you liked the video and it's time to start scaling. Please subscribe for more computer science videos, and for now, I've got a churn, so thanks for watching.